You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast, and I have uh, two guests, uh, Sandra Kahn and Paul Ehrlich. Um, They're going to be talking about uh, a project called JAWS, the story of a hidden epidemic, J-A-W-S, JAWS, like the uh, the shark movie. Um, So it's somewhat related to that and somewhat not, but uh, Sandra and Paul, thank you for coming. How are you doing? Great pleasure. I'm doing great. Thank you. Oh, excellent. So tell me, what what is uh, what's the basis of this project? What is JAWS, and what's the hidden epidemic that uh, you guys are talking about? Sandra ought to tell you about that because she's the JAWS person. Well, okay. we we all, we we get asked what the epidemic is, and I always outline. I said crowding, braces, and sleep. So there's a lot more crowding of the teeth everywhere you look at, especially in children. Everybody seems to have crooked teeth and, and problems with the the size of their mouth compared to the size of their teeth. And so mm-hmm. everybody, all the kids, it's almost a rite of passage. They have to wear braces. And this is, this is a new thing. It's not something that we've had throughout our history. And the second part really? of the epidemic is issues with sleep. And there is a connection between the size of the jaws and the, the quality of our sleep. The, the worst uh, part of the worst Expect of the epidemic is, is sleep apnea, which is when you actually stop breathing at night. But the size of the jaws impacts the tube uh, through the through where the air passes into the lungs. So if the, the jaws are too small, um, then the tongue doesn't fit well. It has to live partly in the throat, and we start snoring. And even children, young children, are starting to have this problem. So it's definitely something that's on the rise. You know, yeah, I know. Maybe Paul can, have, uh, can talk a little bit about the history of how we we moved from uh, from hunter gathering into agriculture and how that created this uh, reduction in, in the size of the jaw. Yeah, we'll get into that in a quick second. But you, you know, you're right. I have uh, children, and they're you know 11, 12, 13, and they have uh, you know some crooked teeth. And you know, my son uh, snores at 11, and uh, you know, so I've been learning a lot about this to see what I could do to help him. You know, like. I guess people traditionally think, oh, if you're 40 or 50 and you snore, no big deal, even though it is a big deal. But for kids to snore, it's surprising. And, um, yeah, it's a problem. So, I, it, you know, I definitely can uh, I can see it firsthand. So, it's, it's a recent problem, too, very clearly, because, you know, if you were an Australopithecus or even a modern human hunter-gatherer and you slept outdoors at night and were hunted by leopards, the kids that snored um, didn't leave their genes in the gene pool. Uh, so there's no question that snoring mm. in children is a very recent thing, like all the rest of this tied uh, to the huge environmental changes that human beings have made on the planet over the last 10,000 years or so. It's an evolutionary problem, uh, and we're not doing anything about it. Well, when you say recent, I mean, it doesn't seem like a 10,000-year problem. This this feels like a uh, last 50 years problem and maybe a last 100 year problem. Or oh, yeah. It? I mean, the, the big change has been in the last few hundred years um, and goes along. It correlates very nicely with industrialization. We're not certain uh, exactly what aspects of industrialization have caused the very clear shrinkage of our jaws during that period. 
there are lots of things um, that we do differently. We moved indoors to where there's a lot of allergens. So our kids tend to have stuffy noses, particularly um, in places where women are working and the children are going to daycare centers. And stuffy noses mean that you don't do what you were designed by evolution to do, that is breathe through your nose. You start breathing yeah. through your mouth, and that leads to uh, a whole array of problems, the ones that, for example, that Sandra mentioned. We also now don't exercise our jaws very much. Um, you know, uh, when was the last time you actually had to chew a piece of meat? You get yourself a nice expensive steak and it melts in your mouth. There's actually yep. a commercial product called Soylent Green in which you're supposed to drink you, all your meals, an entirely mm. soft diet. Well, the doctors tell you to exercise all your striated muscles except for your tongue and your jaw muscles. So uh, we're in a really sad epidemic, one that a lot could be done about but that not much is being done about. Maybe there will be the return of chewing gum. Maybe that would be a good thing. I don't know. Sandra wants to discover a tell them about mastics, Sandra. Well, the ma mastica is a, a, a very um, old Greek um, resin that has been chewed for centuries. And it's a very huh. hard resin. And mastica comes from chewing, masticat. And um, it's it, traditionally, it was chewed a lot. And it has a lot of effects that have been studied scientifically about um, health benefits, but definitely the, the chewing of this, this harder resins as opposed to the petroleum-based gums is uh, something that's become more popular with people that want to improve their jaw. But the, the, I, the thing that I want to go into is more of the question, a lot of orthodontists, a lot of dentists, they, they throw their hands up in the air and they say, well, it must be genetic. And we've de devoted the last at least five years of the research that Paul and I have been doing. And there's absolutely no uh, basis to say that this problem is genetic. It's, it's, uh, it's a problem that has to do with the environment that we're living in and what we're doing, what our habits are. I always like to talk about um, a book that we've looked at from the 1850s. Nine, 1850, there was a, uh, a lawyer, George Kaplan, and he wrote a book he actually called the book Shut Your Mouth and Save Your Life. And he was commissioned to go live with the, the uh, Native Americans to see how come they had less uh, child mortality. And he, he you know, talks about his um, several decades that he spent living with, uh, with the natives. And this, is, this was his conclusion, shut your mouth and save your life. Because he, he, the natives used to nickname the white pale face and, and black mouth because they were breathing through their mouth. And we're talking about, you know, um, almost 200 years ago. And he all recognized that this was a problem. And so we've known that the habits are changing and the, the Native Americans had practices that are described in the book. Like the midwife, uh, after the mother would uh, breastfeed, they would, you know, hold the mouth closed for a little while so the baby would stay with the mouth closed. And they lived outdoors and they, they didn't have that many allergies. And there was already, they started seeing that there was a health component with the, the Native Americans where their children were healthier. So we've known this for a long time and we think technology is going to fix the problem. So we're making better and better braces, but we're not really paying attention to the habits, which is, is really what um, is making a huge difference. And every decade is, is going, getting exponentially worse where our children have more health issues. So let, let me interject that JAWS is both the term name of our interest and the name of our nonprofit book, uh, JAWS, uh, that explains all this in detail with illustrations. And I think all you really need to do is look at a picture of the jaws of a hunter-gatherer and compare it with the jaws of the people you know. And you'll see that in a relatively short time, in much too short a time for genetic evolution to have occurred, uh, in the last few hundred years even, our jaws have shrunk and we're paying a huge price for it. And uh, if you have kids that you're worried about, worry early on. There's a general hmm. idea that somehow you should wait for orthodonture to straighten out teeth 
until all the teeth are in and the kid is grown. That's like if your kid has eyesight problems, wait until he goes blind till you get him glasses. Uh, the is, of course, that you, the problem is misdirected growth of the face. Uh, and if you want to change a growth thing, you have to do it starting early on if you want to be fully successful. And Sandra and one of her great colleagues, Simon Wong in Australia, have been working on techniques to redirect jaw growth that's going in the wrong direction to the right direction. It's a, uh, it's a difficult problem in terms of it needs cooperation of parents and children, but it's an easy solution in many ways. Well, a, a thought came to mind um, as to what's happening possibly with people's jaws. So, you know, like the bones of your body, okay, um, if you put mechanical stress on them, that makes them stronger and they grow. If you don't put mechanical stress on them, you know, I guess there's specialized cells in your bones that, that react to, literally to mechanical stress. So I'm guessing that there's probably the same kind of cells in your mouth and in your jaw. So if you're not putting it under mechanical stress by eating hard foods or chewy foods, that it's, um, that's why it's becoming underdeveloped. Well, maybe that's a heritable thing. It's important to have the right posture to keep your jaws together when you're not eating or talking. Because as you may know from the binding of Chinese women's feet in the old days and some native groups that put bindings on heads to change their shape, it's gentle pressures applied over a long time, which seem to be a real key to the direction in which the, the bones grow. People think of bones as dead, but they're actually some of the most active tissues in our bodies, uh, and they're being replaced all the time and remodeled in various ways. And the trick for getting large jaws as far as adequate jaws so you don't have sleep apnea and snoring seems to be directing the growth well by seeing to it not only that people chew to keep their muscles strong enough to direct the growth properly when they're more or less relaxed, uh, and that um, as long as you keep your jaws in contact, your tongue plastered against the roof of your mouth, uh, you're likely to get up uh, to develop proper big jaws. But doing those things requires a lot of changes. You know, when Paul starts talking about the biology of bone, it's really interesting to me that our profession um, took a wrong turn. It sounds like everything that we're talking about in, in jaws is new or it's, uh, it's something that we came up with. But if we go into orthodontics as a, as a science, which is about 100 years old, we've seen that there's been a lot of research that has looked at this. And the, a very, very well-known, very famous scientist called Harvold in the 1960s. He did experiments with um, with monkeys, and you know he he you know, basically um, uh, just bypassed the nose by you know, using different you know, gizmos and devices inside the mouth, and you know kept the tongue from getting all the way to the roof of the mouth, or just plugged in the nose. And by bypassing the nose, the jaws completely deformed. So we know that uh, you know the normal function of breathing. It's a huge issue when it comes to developing bone. So Paul talks about the binding of feet of you know, Japanese women, and basically we're doing the same thing by letting our children bypass the, the nose. And the nose has a really important uh, job. You know, it filters the air, it warms the air, it moisturizes the air, it has also antibacterial um, chemicals that, are, that go into our our system like nitrous oxide that are important. So there's a lot of things that we're doing that we know that have effects on growth, but we are ignoring it because we are the last, I would say 50 years, we've been focusing only in symptoms and not on the, on the epidemiology or what has caused the problem. So we're not going and removing the, the disease itself or the problem but we're just dealing with the symptoms with technology. So this is something that is, is pretty well known from a lot of years, and we just have to you know, refocus and, and understand that we gotta bring in our children early and deal with these habits that are causing the problems before the problems are evident, which is the most difficult thing to do. Prevention is always difficult to do. The, the issues are not evident. But we have to bring attention back to the very young kids that are developing the habits that will turn into those problems.
because they are they're not aesthetic issues they're they're health issues how do you imagine that breathing through the nose would affect the morphology morphology of the jaw the act of breathing itself does it or what do you think is at play that changes the jaw shape like mechanistically what do you think is happening to cause this well that's what the harold uh, looked at when he plugged in the nose and the monkey started breathing through the mouth if you in anatomy and physiology we have a saying that's use it or lose it and whatever you use will continue to work just like the you know in, in your house you might have um, the tubes that bring in the water into your house if you don't use it they get full of cobwebs same thing if you don't use the nose for breathing, then the the you know the structure will start getting smaller because it's not being used. And if you breathe through your mouth, the mouth is not supposed to be tube shaped. But if you you use it uh, primarily for breathing, which is the uh, the biggest priority in, to sustain life, then the mouth starts becoming more of a tube, which is not ideal for hosting the tongue and the teeth. So we this see is a, a lot very of common kids. sort of physiological thing. For example, uh, people who are blind at birth because they have cataracts don't develop the power to see properly. Uh, and if they have their sight restored when they're, say, 18, they can see a figure against the background, but they can't tell a square from a circle. And if you look at their hmm. brains, uh, a lot of the brain that is normally dedicated to seeing uh, has become changed and is dedicated to uh, hearing and smelling. And um, mm -hmm. it's a standard thing. And as you, you, if you don't continually exercise something, the odds are you're going to lose it or it's going to lose part of its function. And that's what clearly happens, again, uh, when you stop using the nose properly and your airway properly and keeping your tongue in the right position and letting your teeth develop properly. The way the teeth develop depends in part on where the tongue is, uh, what the pressures are from the cheeks and the jaw muscles and so on. Uh, and when you disrupt that, uh, it's going to move things in the wrong direction. And the only way to really cure that, as opposed to treating the symptoms with braces of two smaller jaws, is to redirect the growth. Uh, and that's a little complicated, but it's, in a sense, easy. Hmm. If you start early well, enough. It sounds like the order in which you need to address things is first allow the person to breathe through their nose. So, like, you know, I myself, until I changed my diet, my nose was stuffed up all the time for years and years and years. And, you know, doctors said, oh, you, you just have a deviated septum. And, you know, but when I changed my diet, you know, I re eliminated dairy and some other stuff. Uh, my nose cleared up. So I was able to breathe through my nose for the first time ever. But a lot of people, like, like you mentioned, they can't even breathe through their nose if they wanted to. So it seems like that needs to be addressed first. Then maybe naturally, if you're able to breathe through your nose from that point, uh, maybe the morphology will change on its own. Maybe it won't. I don't know. But then an intervention seems like it would help. But what, what's your thought? In a sense, the prevention is the basic way to go. You want to have kids grow up in an environment which includes the cultural environment in which they're uh, jaw development goes in the right direction. Uh, unfortunately, of course, uh, our diet is terrible. The processed food diet that we're on doesn't supply the things we need as much as it should, and it supplies things that we become addicted to, particularly sugar, uh, that it shouldn't. And we're suffering a huge range of diseases having connections to the diet, uh, which uh, are costing us huge amounts of money uh, with the so-called um, uh, various syndromes. But um, the, the, the problem of changing all that means changing very powerful financial interests. We are hooked on the wrong kinds of things, and it's done absolutely deliberately. The fact that there's sugar in virtually everything you eat when sugar is not needed or a natural food and can be extremely dangerous for you, uh, tells you right off uh, that we're not paying attention to, uh, to prevention. We're paying attention to treatment. Diabetes, heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, and so on are all tied to these things, as are the jaw issues. There's even a connection between the deformed jaws that we're getting and Alzheimer's disease. It's not as documented as we'd like, and one of the reasons is that 
medicine and and uh, dentistry have become separated so that uh, many of the big time studies that have told us what's wrong medically with things like uh, type 2 diabetes uh, have not been able to ask the questions we ought to be asking about the jaws. We don't know, for example, with any surety what the use of braces is around the world and how rapidly it's increasing because there are no long-term studies of this. And the science behind dentistry is extraordinarily weak, particularly uh, in the area of orthodontics, and that's that's from their own studies. Taking a, um, a subset of, of that, what have you seen as the effect of braces? I mean, the intended effect is supposedly is straighten the teeth, et cetera, but is it actually a net negative on the person? Is it necessary or is there, you know, are there better ways to do it? And does, again, do braces well, cause the, harm? The analogy that I have, to, uh, I like to use is that you can, if you have a space problem, you can change the teeth to fit the jaws that are already small, or you can change the jaws to fit all the teeth. We have 32 teeth, including the wisdom teeth. And not having all our teeth, it's, it is a problem. So it's not necessarily that braces are causing the problem, but it's the fact that we're not uh, changing the jaws by you know, addressing the habits or doing you know, the, the type of therapies that can help us keep up the size of the jaw with the number of teeth that we have. So the, the braces are started too late, and then by the time they're started, the jaws are, pre are pretty much set. So what you do is you either take some teeth out or you reshape the teeth or... You know, I would say 90% of people have their wisdom teeth taken out, as if it was something that didn't have a use. And when you have, if you think of a, a bridge with more, uh, or, or an arc that has more uh, pieces, more bricks, it's a larger arc. And our tongue lives inside, you know, this arc, and the pieces are our teeth. So if you have more pieces, you have a bigger arc. So the tongue can live, you know, comfortably ahead of the throat. If you have less teeth, if you don't have the 32, and you know, most people like me will have 28 teeth only because I had my wisdom teeth taken out. It's a smaller arc, and a lot of people, if they have extractions of bicuspid, which is common with orthodontics, then they only have 24 teeth. So that's a very small space for the tongue to live. So the teeth might look straight, and the braces might have done a good job just aesthetically getting the teeth lined up. But there is a, a medical component that the tongue is not going to be happy there. And we start snoring either early or later in our life. And that can turn into sleep apnea. And the, the other thing is that if our tongue doesn't quite fit, we tend to breathe more through our mouth. And if we breathe through our mouth, there's associated stress that is uh, uh, apparent. And, and we know that when we breathe through our mouth, our body, our cells are more vulnerable to stress because if you think about the parasympathetic response and sympathetic, which is sympathetic is when you're, you know, fight or flight, when you're trying to escape from the tiger, your, your mouth gets dry, you don't have any saliva and you take a breath through your mouth. So that's when your cells are all dedicated only to either fight the tiger or run away from it. They're not dedicated to repairing themselves. So the cells of our body are vulnerable when we're mouth breathing. And this is stuff that we're looking at with, um, with stress specialists like, like Robert Sapolsky that, you know, they, they look into what kind of effects you have when you're mouth breathing. So it's not that braces are necessarily bad, but they're not addressing the real problem. And they're, they're causing um, us to think that things are fine when they're not. Does Boy. that make sense? The evidence supports this entirely. For example, uh, wisdom teeth are an invention of industrialization. Uh, if you talk to the people who know the fossils of human beings going way back, there ain't no wisdom teeth. There's the normal third molars, which we've named wisdom teeth because of the crowding that sometimes leads us to remove them. And by the way, most of the removals, or at least a very large portion of them, are useless and dangerous. Uh, there's lots of problems with them, as the government has reported, but you can make a lot of money taking wisdom teeth out. Um, because of our book, Jaws, where we say this, uh, we're being sued by several of the really uh, expensive automobile companies because, of course, they're supported by the oral surgeons who make a living taking out uh, wisdom teeth. Uh, really? But <laughs> there ain't no wisdom teeth. 
in, in fossil human beings, in hunter-gatherers, and so on, because the jaws are big enough for all of the teeth. And mm. mention stress. Again, stress is tied into the whole physiological syndrome, the whole array of problems uh, with non-transmissible disease that are now racking humanity. Stress is very bad for you. You've doubtless heard about cortisol and the interactions between the various hormones that control uh, our entire lives. Uh, and stress is really, really bad. It's something that makes us sick that ruins our lives, that leads uh, to suicide, that leads to depression, which is becoming more and more common, ADHD and so on. And a major stressor, as Sandra already mentioned, is lack of sleep, disrupted sleep, sleep disruptors. Right, right. And uh, there's a building field of sleep medicine. And it, you know, it turns out that not, not cha cha changing people's jaws in the right direction, leads to many deaths too. More people are killed on the highway by lack of sleep, by dozing drivers than by people in DUI, by drinking drivers. Right, right. So, all right, so what's the, uh, what's the recommendation? You know, what, what kind of um, common issues will people experience and what can they do about it? What are some suggestions? Let's say well, let me... apnea or snoring or, you know, uh, breathing through their mouth all the time. What, what are some things they can do to address this stuff? Well, let me give you a little bit of uh, what it would be like the list or, or the recipe that we should really follow. And, um, you know, people ask me, you know, what can I do? So we got to go back to what our recommendations are from day one. And now we, we're looking the evolutionary medicine, looking at even what the mother should do when she's pregnant. But the, the ideal is to try to follow what we know that's physiologically uh, therapeutic, ther therapeutic, and that would be to, as soon as the baby is born, breastfeed, because that starts um, training the, the airway, training the muscles, and it, it, it requires hard work. So try to avoid um, feeding with bottles passively. But, you know, this is not critical for, uh, there's a lot of women that can't breastfeed. So if you miss that, the next very, very important uh, point is in addition to making sure that the babies have their mouth closed, because I walk around and see that, you know, babies are just in their strollers and in their sleep, hanging their mouth open. So the parents have to be taught how to teach them how to close their mouth. But then the critical point is weaning. Everybody should be able to wean their children into hard, non-processed foods. And by non-processed, I mean, you know, that they haven't been, you know, with uh, added chemicals and things that are also causing inflammation. So they're going to cause more um, airway issues and more difficulty breathing. But the weaning is important because they, the tongue and the, the structures in the mouth have to negotiate the, the, you know, beginnings of speech and how to, you know, move the tongue around to be able to speak and chew and how the teeth you know, develop the, the strength to be grinding the food. So this is a critical, critical time. So we, we like to talk to parents and say, really, really pay attention to how you wean your children and learn a little bit about it. Happily, there's already books that are out there teaching parents what to do. And there's a, there, there's a growing culture that is, is talking about this period. For us, it's the, the most critical period. We always say that the problems start as soon as we start feeding our children with a spoon. So we, we tell parents to stay away from the spoon. Um, after that, we need to continue a diet where chewing is encouraged. We can't just give our kids, like Paul was talking about soil and green and, and all kinds of vegetables that are just, you know, blended into smoothies. We gotta have them chew the full vegetable, the full, full um, fruit, if it's an apple, and have them you know, just be vigilant on how our kids are chewing. Just, just not throw food at them and then, you know, in the car and just keep driving. But just make sure that you pay attention and you guide your children to chew properly. To make sure they close their mouth, that when they're talking, they make pauses. They're not, you know, running their words and slurring. Just have them uh, make pauses and breathe through their nose. Most of the things that you can do are out there way before you get to see a, uh, an orthodontist. So the parents need to work on these 
first 18 months of life and train their kids to really build up a healthy, a healthy system that can um, foster knife, knife growing jaws. And so once you pass that, then you, the parents can start seeing symptoms. And we have a whole section in our, like Paul likes to say, our nonprofit book, um, mm-hmm. JAWS, where we, we teach the parents how to read the face. And, you know, one of the examples I like to, to use is when the kids smile and you see a lot of gum, that face is growing down and back. So that is a, a huge alarm sign, a sign for alarm that you should, you know, take seriously. And, you know, you should see what's going on, why the jaws are growing in the wrong, in the wrong direction. And if you catch it early, then there's a lot of things you can do. You know, removing tonsils and adenoids sometimes helps. So the kids are not breathing through the mouth. They're not hanging their mouth open. But these are, these are critical years that the parents need to be in control. And, you know, that, that's why we, we really, the end of our book is, is really asking uh, parents to, um, just you know, go out and, and, and demand you know better treatment for their children, refuse extractions, and ask for prevention in every um, area of the kid's life. But you know, think of all the things that you can do to prevent the problems as opposed to wait and then demand treatments for the, the problems that have been developed. So this is this is let's say the first five years you can do a lot of prevention. After five, six, seven years, it's very hard, and we do have techniques that help. But uh, the techniques are not going to, you know, take things to the, the most ideal. But they can, they can help. And we have programs like the GOPEX program that is very successful um, helping kids develop the, the right habits. We do a lot of expansion on young kids and older kids. And unfortunately, for the older kids like my own daughter, they, they have to go through surgery because once the... Yeah. the ideal age passes. I didn't know a lot of these things when my kids were, were growing up. And my, my daughter, unfortunately, you know, did not get all this um, knowledge. The reason I got involved in all this was because my son was having problems with snoring and sleep apnea. And so I knew that this was not good. So I started focusing a lot on him and my daughter fell through the cracks and then she had to have surgery to get her jaws moved forward so that her airway is at the right size and she can you know, now have a, a very healthy life. But you, every kid is different. Every, every situation is different. You have a couple of kids. Um, you mentioned earlier in the show. And I right. unfortunately, yep. right. sounds like all your kids are past the age where you can really do prevention. But there's things that you can keep them away from. And then there's other things that you, know, you can do to help them foster better habits. You know, one of the things we can do is not go back... Uh, to uh, say Sandra's generation, because she's very young, but go back to my Mm -hmm. grandmother's generation, when parents paid attention, for example, to their child's posture, sit up straight at the table, chew your food many times, used to have dinner Mm -hmm. with the children. uh, And so uh, it was a great social thing, but it also saw to it that the kids didn't uh, just watch their cell phones or uh, chew right. randomly and swallow their food uh, and smoothies very rapidly and so on. We really ought to move back in time to do things that most societies have always done since the Industrial Revolution, since actually we ended hunter-gathering. Uh, and all those things are important. Your The posture of your jaws is connected to the posture of your entire body. If you're having trouble with your airway, uh, very often you end up changing your posture in order to be able to breathe better, but that then ties in to pain in the back and issues like that. People ought to look at the problems we're creating with some of our creations that could be easily changed. Uh, Kids, I was talking uh, with a friend today who has a 15-year-old daughter who spends her entire time basically bent over a cell phone. Uh, Mm, It's turning out that we're getting an epidemic of nearsightedness of myopia because children particularly this is particularly happening in China, don't focus their idea, eyes at a distance enough or at least are not in the, in the primitive light conditions that most of our ancestors went through. And so uh, focusing on cell phones is leading one way or another to myopia. Uh, hmm. We should be paying attention to our children and their posture and not letting them run wild. I hate to say it. Uh, I didn't like it when my parents disciplined me 
Uh, but a more discipline from parents is one of the things that we're losing in our society because the parents don't understand what's best for the kids. It's not best for the kids to let them do whatever the hell they please. Their frontal lobes right. aren't myelinated yet. They haven't got uh, the control that comes from frontal lobe uh, myelination, that is uh, insulating the neurons in the part of your brain that controls your uh, ability to resist drugs and things like that. That's not completed till you're about 25. Uh, and parents need to keep the kids going in the right direction for a long time. Otherwise, you know, it's we we call our soldiers that walk that walk infantry. You know, the term comes directly from infant. That is, people people won't go and get shot at if they have their frontal lobes myelinated fully. Well, uh, prevention is the best, but unfortunately, it's much harder to sell prevention then sell a cure, you know, or intervention after the fact, you know, and everyone's guilty of this. So what, uh, what about strategies where, you know, the parents for they either did well or they didn't do well and the kids are where they are and they're, you know, they're teenagers or maybe older, what can they do to help themselves? Or, you know, if you're an adult and you have issues sleeping and breathing and et cetera, what can you do then? There's gotta be things that can be done to help you. Well, there are things that can be done to help you. Uh, there's a growing Industry, for example, of in CPAP machines, which actually give you positive pressure and help prevent our, my daughter is on one uh, and it helps her sleep at night, which is important. But of course, if you, she didn't start really young, now they're putting kids on CPAP machines and that may affect mm. their neural systems that, that help them to breathe. We don't know what the long term effect is. But one of the things uh, we could be doing is what you and I and Sandra are doing right now, trying to get the public to pay more attention to these things uh, and to try and develop a food system that is designed to make healthy people as healthy as possible, not one that's designed to give a relatively few people very high profits. Because what we eat these days and most of our behavior is tuned just, and this is by, by the way, relatively new in human society, is tuned to finance. How much profit can you make? How much, you know, how much more valuable is the latest iPhone than the, than the, the one before that you had to switch into? Um, is it really better to get your fruit in a drink uh, when you can have a delicious apple or a delicious pear or what have you? And do we have to have our fruits semi-liquid as fruits? We select, we've selected our fruits so that, for example, the peaches we can buy here in Palo Alto, often you could suck them out of the skin. They're so near to liquid, whereas chewing, so there's lots and lots of things we can do. And you're, in my view, doing one of them right now, trying to educate the public on a really desperate issue that nobody's paying attention to. But, you know, I'm just concerned the, the section of the public that has doesn't have kids and they have their own problems. Or the section of the public that has kids, but they're teenagers, you know, besides saying, well, you should have done it earlier. How do you help that gigantic cohort of people that's in that situation? That is a complicated issue. Every case has to be seen independently. And um, the things to understand is you have to be uh, aware of what's going on, who's, you know, follow the money and see, you know, if this is something that if, you know, if you're a practitioner, is really focusing on your problem or this is the the way to to make a living which really comes from the the problem that we have with the the universities and the cost and the debt that a lot of these clinicians you know medical school and dental school uh, kids uh, are growing out uh, coming out of school with huge debts so they have to go out and and create a revenue model and i don't think the public is aware that that's something that affects all of us. It's not something that um, that is just affecting the, the ones with the debt because they have to pay the debt with whatever they found inside your mouth or in, in your body as physicians. So we have to make sure that we evaluate each technique. And there's a lot of stuff that's being offered that is only palliative. And the, the human body um, adapts very well to different conditions. So sometimes you know, people will go and get, you know, snoring devices or, you know, sleep apnea uh, machines and stuff like that that deal with the hip symptoms. 
and to really consider cures um, you know, I can't give you an answer for everyone, but like I, I mentioned before, my own daughter at 15 had to have surgery that you know, basically fractures both her jaws and moves the jaw forward to give her the, the correct airway. And right now that's an expensive surgery. My daughter did not have it done in the, in the U.S. She had it done in Spain where the medical system is different. And um, I'm not saying that it can't be done here, but the cost sometimes is, it's um, it, it's not permissive. And the, the other thing is that a lot of doctors, a lot of dentists, they don't know, um, don't, they're not familiar with the techniques that can cure the problem. They're only familiar with the techniques that can be palliative, that can deal with symptoms. So every, every adult has to make their own, their own decision. But there is a lot of, um, a lot of misery and suffering going on with, with, uh, with adults and, and teenagers. And there's a lot of um, charlatan um, on the internet offering magic cures, and it's it's really a difficult a d- difficult solution. This is why we wrote this nonprofit book to try to give a little bit of guidance because there's things you can do, things that you should never do, and there's you know everybody wants to to have a magic uh, pill that will you know cure you of the problem, and sometimes we don't know that there's things that are associated. Now sleep is becoming more. Um, well known that you know, Ariana Huffington wrote a book about you know sleep, and now we know that sleep is important. But sometimes if you don't breathe well, you might be having depression or other symptoms that are treated with you know um, pharmaceuticals, and that's a huge business that is you know it, it's manipulated by corporations. So you might just have a problem with your your breathing. In your sleep, and that's maybe causing other issues. And there's a lot of literature, like Paul mentioned, with uh, you know, things like uh, attention deficit that's you know treated with drugs. That sometimes is just a sleep problem with young kids, and it's not being addressed because we, as a society, we're looking for that magic, uh, quick fix. And what we do is we, as Paul said, our system has a lot of um, personal responsibility. Changing of the habits is difficult. And for older children and adults, surgery is well done with a conscientious practitioner and, and with a lot of uh, knowledge is, uh, is what's needed. What, uh, nobody wants to hear that, but let's say you, uh, you know, a teenager or a kid had a leg that was longer than the other, and their doctor said, well, you have to you know, go to surgery and have that, the shorter leg lengthened. You, everybody would say yes. If somebody said, "Well, don't worry, I'll give you a shoe, and we'll, you know, we'll build up a, a heel that's higher in one shoe, and then you'll be fine," everybody would say, "No, I'd rather have the surgery." So we gotta be open to solutions that are not simple, that are more complicated, and, and do our homework for our kids and for ourselves. Look, there are some very simple things that everybody who can afford it, and I, I say that's a big element. For example. It's almost impossible in some places to get a decent diet. Uh, on Yap Island, mm-hmm. once Anne and I were taken by a local person into a bodega uh, so he could pick up some stuff for dinner uh, at his family for, with his family. There wasn't a single thing in this little grocery store that Anne and I would eat or feed to our child. There were 13 kinds of sugar mixed with various things for breakfast foods. I feel the same way about Starbucks in most places. There's almost nothing good there, you know. Yeah, it's, it is, but poor people are in tough shape often to, to find fresh food, fish that hasn't been farmed because often in farming they feed them on corn, which produces fish which don't have the uh, the right acid, the right fats. So eating the freshest possible food, uh, exercising. If there's one thing that all the literature that's fluctuated around on fats and sugars and so on and so forth, um, everybody agrees that the more active you are, even if it means I have a little thing by my computer that I set for 30 minutes every time I sit down, so I'm reminded to get up and walk around every 30 minutes, and I walk to the office every day. Exercise is something that you really want to pay attention to, and then you got to learn. You have to be able to protect yourself. You cannot, uh, you know, here we are in a world some people actually listen to Fox News and think it's news rather than propaganda. Uh, so uh, it's it's a world that's complex. 
If you want your kids to grow up in a complex world, discipline them and discipline them to learn, to not necessarily believe everything you say. Then you may say, you've got to obey me. Fine, if it's things like not running into the freeway or uh, not leaning over a, uh, a cell phone all day long. But eventually, they've got to learn to make good decisions for themselves. And learning is a lifelong process. The world is changing so fast. Uh, you know, when when I was a kid, there were no cell phones. When I came to Stanford, there were no Xerox machines. Uh, there were no tape recorders. Things have changed in just the last relatively few decades very dramatically. And even us old guys have to try and keep up with it if we're going to remain healthy. There's no yeah. easy fix, although booze can help. <laughs> As Paul always says, there's so many issues that we can't do anything about, and this is one that is, is culturally based. So if we if we really change our culture, we might not be able to help ourselves, but our children, our preteens, you know, a very short period, we could you know implement some of these preventive measures in daycares and teach kids how to have the correct posture and the right breathing, and you know, some of our kids might not be you know. Um, benefiting of these techniques, but uh, their, their children, our grandchildren, you know, we, by having this book available, I've had people that have changed the life of their grandchildren because they knew themselves had issues and their children had issues, and they also were able to mitigate some of the suffering that they or their grown children might have. But uh, we have some good things like the CPAPs and the surgeries and, you know, a lot of adults are now starting to chew more and focus more on breathing through their nose. And this is, this is changing people's lives. So it, it, it's not hopeless. It's something that can be addressed and it can be addressed in a personal way. In, in small communities, uh, um, just changing the outlook of how we do simple things can have a tremendous impact. Trying, for example, to get universities to see to it that everybody learns basic evolutionary theory. It's not that complex. It can be taught really in a relatively few days. And if you had it taught, we would not, for example, be losing our antibiotics now, this huge problem of um, resistance in bacteria to antibiotics, something we knew all about that I've been teaching about since the 1950s. And we still haven't trained enough people and enough doctors to know how to deal with antibiotic resistance, with insecticide resistance, and so on. We need to tr change our educational system to fit the modern world. Uh, Stanford is the best university in the world. It's pathetic in trying to get all of its undergraduates taught to deal with issues like DDT resistance in insects, uh, new novel, uh, novel germs that are resistant to all antibiotics, climate change, loss of biodiversity, and so on. You can get all the way through Stanford without having the first clue why our, we're in desperate trouble and facing uh, a collapse of civilization. And that's at the best university in the world. Just think of what it's like at Berkeley. <laughs> I, I hear the same thing about medical school. Uh, we weren't taught nutrition in medical school. Uh, we weren't taught this in medical school. What were you taught? So it's not, you know, it's not just university, but I mean, all our professionals, our dentists, our doctors, our everything, they're not taught any of this, any of the stuff they need either. So I don't know what's going to happen, but there's a, there's a huge disparity between what is and what needs to be known uh, based on uh, what I've seen. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Well, one of the things that I'd like to point out, uh, and I usually in every interview that we do c comes up and is, you know, the, the interesting collaboration of you know, clinical orthodontists and evolutionary biologists. But this is a, a clear example of how scientists should be broader in their view. Right now, we tend to be very siloed in, in our knowledge and our understanding of uh, things, and we're you know, focusing more and more in, in narrower fields, and we're not collaborating. So this book, uh, JAWS, is a, a clear example of you know, two very separate, very distinct um, areas that we found a common ground, and we need more of this. Hmm. Well, um, I think we're just about out of time. But what what resources do you have for listeners? So how can they get access to the uh, 
you know, it looks like there was a long YouTube video about it. I don't know if that's the book itself or if the book is just in book form. I mean, what's the, the best way for them to find out more? The book is kept inexpensive, and any money coming in the way of royalties is going to go to support trying to make the changes in the world that uh, we're talking about. Um, there's also a number of things posted that give the basic message. And Sandra has a website. Can you give them what it is, Sandra? Well, my website is called Forward Onyx. So it's forward, like, you know, the opposite of backward, forward Onyx, like orthodontics at forwardonyx.com. And we have clinicians and we have the exercise program. We now have an app that can be downloaded. It's free. And um, you can practice your, your exercises and your, your proper all habits through the app. So we, there, there's, we're building uh, uh, resources for, for people to go in and be able to educate and find out more about how to help themselves and their family and loved ones. Okay, so forward Dantics. And, uh, and again, where can they get JAWS? Amazon or where, where can they go to get the ebook? book uh, That's the easiest place uh, to get it. And, uh, again, I think it's $18 or something like that, which for some people is not a problem. For others, it is. But then you can find the basic message um, in uh, on the websites and so on. So uh, uh, the, the nice thing about the book is that it has the lists of symptoms and so on that are very simple to get to. Uh, and uh, do you have a website? If, if I myself? send you um, a... Uh, a version of the talk, can you post it? Yeah, yeah, we can put it in the show notes and everything. That'll be great, sure. Sandra and I will will send a a copy of a talk we gave at the Commonwealth Club uh, that has the basic message, and you can always get the book out of the library if you can't afford it. And it's an expensive world today, and we understand that. If you are a multi-billionaire, though, uh, our operations could use a few million dollars uh, to uh, (laughs) keep pushing the message. Yeah, the problem a few billion short, but you know, working on it. But uh, okay. But guys, thank you. Uh, thank thank you for coming. I really appreciate your time and you being on the call. No, it's my great pleasure. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank right. you. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious that we all have medical issues or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves, or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.